Welcome to the next edition of the Bobcat Cam webinar series. Today's topic is what's new in V30 3D milling. Now, as you know, my name is Al DePaulo. I'm the voice of the Bobcat After Dark video series. You can find me on Instagram at Al DePaulo or hashtag Bobcat After Dark. In today's webinar, we'll learn about the new 3D features in the version 30 and review the toolpath strategies you can choose from. What are you going to learn? We're going to talk about holder collision avoidance, the new adaptive uh, vertical arc leads, lead in and lead out, undercutting with the mill professional, and an introduction to the mill premium tool paths. When we're talking about holder collision avoidance, I'll do a review with check surfaces, talk about the new in-process stock feature, uh, or the differences between in-process stock and machining surfaces, and then also review the clearances for your tool parts. Now, for the adaptive roughing, we have added a vertical arc lead in and out option, so I'll show you where to turn that on, and then I'll also review some of the simulation options for the tool path, which I think are really cool. Uh, we will review the mill professional undercutting using a T cutter or a lollipop and then go over some of the options that are available for that. That is a new feature to the version 30 to be able to do undercutting with the mill professional. And the last thing that we'll review are the new mill premium toolpaths, kind of as an introduction. Uh, there's six mill standard toolpaths, seven mill professional, and eight mill premium toolpaths. So I'll get into a few of them uh, just as an introduction, kind of a lead into the next webinar. Now, as always with Bobcad, you can expect fewer steps, better cuts, and more profit. Okay, give me just a second to set my screen up now, guys and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. It looks like some of you have done a shout out from where you're from. Uh, Roger in the UK, George in Chicago, Ben in Louisiana. Uh, we got Ken in California, John in California, Gary in Colorado. I appreciate each and every one of you spending some time with me here today. Uh, it's a pleasure. I really enjoy doing these webinars, and I really couldn't do them without you guys. So thank you so much for everybody showing up. It does look like we have people from all over the world. We have Belgium, California, Hawaii, New Mexico, UK, Netherlands, and so on and so on. So thank you, everybody, so much. Now, um, Larry, it's okay if if you're not a customer, that's okay. You can join these webinars. It's an open webinar to talk about the new features. I hold them pretty much every week, and I uh, hope to see you here in more of the webinars. Now, a couple of quick questions before I get into the first file here. Um, Let's see, if you are a Bobcat customer, go ahead and just let me know what version you're running, whether you're running 24, 25, 26, 28, 29. Um, that would be great. If you could also tell me what level of software, whether you're running Mill Standard, Mill Express, um, Mill Professional, that would be great. Besides that, uh, because today's topic is about 3D machining, if you are, uh, I, I kind of want to get an idea of how much 3D machining you do. Do you, you know, and I, I don't know necessarily how to word that, but, you know, maybe I do a lot of 3D machining, I do a little 3D machining, or I'm interested in doing more 3D machining. That would be uh, really helpful for me to help understand the audience and what you guys are interested in, do, in, in doing. Okay, so again, we're gonna talk about a few different things. The first topic that's up is holder collision avoidance. Okay, now this is gonna be more of a review. Um, I have this part model here that I, that I created. Um, you know, and I know sometimes you guys ask, I mean, I do import files, I also draw parts in SolidWorks, um, and I also draw parts within Bobcad. If we're curious of what I use to create this design, I just created some sketches, pretty simple, did some extrudes and uh, extrude cuts, and that's how we were able to get our layout here. And if we look at this, um, this file, basically we got like a little bit of curvature here and some curvature on the bottom, and uh, that's what we're working with. Okay. So, holder collision avoidance. Uh, 
really the purpose behind this is to help you use shorter, more rigid tooling uh, by altering the tool path so the tool holder and parts do not contact your part model or do not gouge your part model. That is uh, really the purpose of this. Now, to begin with, this is more so a review. I have a couple of uh, tool path features set up here. I'm going to start with the mill. Um, uh, the planar toolpath here. Okay, so this first toolpath is our toolpath. You can see it's a, a planar toolpath. It's running back and forth um, at an angle. You know, and we're going to go back and forth to finish up this part. This is really common toolpath. Uh, people run in, uh, or people do this kind of work on a regular basis. So what I'm going to do is uh, just kind of look at what we have going on here. Now, the tool that I'm using is a, a little ridiculous, but it, it does help me um, demonstrate exactly what's happening. So as the tool comes down, uh, because we don't have the, the length of tool or, or holder diameter is definitely in the way, what we're going to see is that tool holder is going to make contact with our model, and that's what we're trying to avoid. Okay? So... Uh, the first routine here I have set up, this is doing no checking. The second routine that I have here is the same routine, but in this case, I'm using check surfaces to um, move the, the tool path out of the way for the tool holder. And that's what we see here, is that as the tool comes down, let me zoom in a little bit, you can see it moves over because it's able to... to uh, you know, identify that there would be a collision and then it offsets for it and then it works its way down to give us clearance. Again, the, the idea here being using the shorter tools to machine as much of the material as we can and then we can go back with larger tools to machine the rest of the material, okay? So, uh, that's just uh, an example of the planar tool path. Now, the difference between this tool path here and uh, this toolpath here is just the, the check surfaces. So if we go into the first feature and we look under our gouge check, you can see I have nothing that I'm utilizing at this point. If we look at our second feature here and we go into our gouge check, you're going to see that I do have check one checked on. Um, I'm using a zero allowance. The uh, selected check surfaces that I used, um, you could select the whole model. In this case, I just picked these surfaces here. So those are the surfaces that I want to pay attention to. All right. Um, when I'm checking, you know, you can check against the, the tool, but, you know, in this case, we really want to look at against the tool holder. So you want to make sure to, to check this option on. And then as far as the strategy goes, we're using a retract tool strategy. Okay, so that is how we're able to uh, to check against our tool holder. So I'm going to uncheck this and I'll recompute the toolpath. And by doing so, you'll see that we get our nice clean toolpath following along here. When I turn the gouge check back on with these settings and I recompute, you're going to see the toolpath is altered because it's avoiding uh, the holder so that it, the holder isn't running into those surfaces. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, if you guys have any questions about that right now, go ahead, uh, fire away. Uh, keep in mind, every question is a good question. If you're in today's webinar, I would ask that you ask at least one question. I know some people are shy. Some people are not sure if the question is relevant. Just ask it. It's fine. I'll do my best to answer it either live in the webinar or I will answer it in the Q&A uh, that will be emailed to you after the webinar. Okay, so that's the first thing we're looking at is the tool holder. Now, you know, again, how we accomplished this was using gouge check. We checked on our check surface. We selected the surfaces that we wanted the software to look at, which were these surfaces here. Okay. Now, in this case, because it's like a finishing routine, um, you can do this uh, with an allowance of zero. That's what I used was an allowance of zero. Uh, Reginald had a question, is that in pro? Yes, check surface is available in mill professional. Okay, so if you're a mill professional user, you will have check surfaces and you can follow this same workflow here. Okay, so again, because I'm finishing, I can have a, an allowance in here. If I add an allowance in here, really um, what it's going to do is just push 
that toolpath out a little bit further. That's all. It's going to push the toolpath out further. So if you're doing like a semi-finish routine, you can use that. Again, I need to make sure that I check both the tool and the tool holder. If I check just the tool, I will have um, the toolpath being checked against these surfaces, but really I wouldn't be looking at the tool holder at that point, okay? So if I come in here and I edit this feature and I go to my gouge check, I want to make sure that I'm checking both the tool and the holder, okay? All right, now as far as the strategy goes, in this case I'm using retract tool, which means the tool would move up in Z, okay? If I I also have the option to do a trim and relink. There are some options in here. Uh, I'm going to just go ahead and compute this here. And what you'll see is where the collisions are, they are trimmed away. Now, in this particular scenario, not the most beneficial way to attack this, but in other scenarios, that can be very useful. Okay, so again, we have our gouge check. We select our check surfaces and allowance. We check both the tool and the holder, and then we set our strategy. In this case, I'm setting it to relink. We compute, and that's what gives us our result. Now, as far as you know, how it is offsetting or how it is, because um, basically that's what happens is the tool path is uh, bumped uh, out of the way. Okay, so how much? does that tool path move out of the way that's where we look at our tool clearances and we have uh, either cylindrical or conical and then this allows you to type in the amounts uh, of clearance that will be added to either the shaft of the tool which would be like the shank um, the arbor of the tool which is what is actually holding the tool and then the tool holder the cell uh, the holder itself okay so you can make these adjustments now um, Gary did ask a question what are the check two three and four for okay well the reason why you have multiple checking routines is um, you could check different surfaces with different parts of your tool whether it's the tool or the tool holder um, and you can layer your gouge checking on so instead of you may have different surfaces or different finishes you want to leave you may want to check um, the shank against a uh, certain geometry you may want to check the holder against certain geometry so instead of just having one level of check you can layer on multiple levels of check so hopefully that makes sense Gary uh, if you could just write back in the uh, question section that'd be great all right, very good. So let me go back to my uh, clearances here. Again, what I'm going to do, I mean, if, if I make an adjustment to this number here, the tool path will offset more um, in this number or this number, okay? So that's basically when you're looking at, well, how does it know how much to stay away from the surface? That is found from your tool clearances. You have your clearance type, which would be cylindrical or conical. You have your shaft value. You have your arbor and your holder value. And that's what we're looking at. Angular clearance. I don't. I don't know if this necessary carry uh, necessarily carries over. This is more of a. I believe more of a when you have more uh, more tilt control when you're dealing with four and five axis type stuff. Uh, hey Ben, no problem. We'll catch up with you later. Have an awesome day, and thank you very much for the acknowledgement, Gary. Okay, very good. All right, so this is what we're looking at for as a review on gouge checking with check surfaces for your holder. This one was a planar routine. The next one here we have our uh, Z level finish. Uh, this first routine here is not checked against the tool, so or against the holder. So as this comes down the wall, you're going to see how the tool holder is colliding um, into the part model. So we want to avoid that. Um, this next routine here, this is with the checking on, and when we back plot this, you can see how the tool holder is then avoiding that particular surface here. Now, a quick note, last uh, week's webinar, uh, well, I guess the week before, uh, we had talked about the toolpath editor, you know, and it just so happens that this uh, is a kind of a good example of where you know sometimes you get toolpath that you may or may not want and just a quick and easy way to trim it away I'm actually going to go to the first routine here and uh, this is again a little review from last week you can go to your feature you can go to edit toolpath you can window in the toolpath that you want to remove 
you can execute an OK, and you can see how quick and easy it was to eliminate that toolpath versus trying to check it out or you know set up a different boundary. Again, again, we'll do the same thing with this one. We can come in here and edit our toolpath. We can go to a top view here. Um, this time we're going to use the polygon pick because that will help us with um, zooming in. So I'm just going to zoom in over to here. I'm going to zoom in over to here. I'm going to come down to the bottom here, over to here, and then come over to here like that. Once I have everything within the box, I right click OK. I have my command set to delete. I'm going to execute and OK. And again, just a quick and easy way to get rid of toolpath that you may or may not want. OK, so we, we showed it with planar. Uh, checking against the holder, we showed it with Z-level finish here. But really where the one that we really want to focus on is this advanced rough. OK, so the new feature that's found in the version 30 applies specifically to the advanced rough. Um, this is the in-process stock um, checking and then checking against machining surfaces. OK, so the way here, here I have the same example. I have a, a no check set up. If I come in here and I do a back plot, you're going to see as the tool comes around, the holder is not being checked against, and the holder is running up into the part. Okay, so what can we do to avoid that? We can come in here with our uh, gouge check. Actually, let me turn this one off for a second. We're going to come in here, and we're going to turn our gouge check on. We're going to select our check surfaces, which is going to be everything here. We have a zero allowance. We're checking against the tool and holder. We're retracting the tool and then we're going to go ahead and compute. All right, so what this will do is it will uh, check against the holder, and you can see the toolpath moves in, and if we run this through the back plot, you can see the holder is no longer making contact with those surfaces. But the problem, not necessarily a problem, but one of the conditions that you're seeing here is kind of like a direct link. If we zoom in here, you can see how it comes here and then it comes down like that. Um, that may or may not be the tool motion that we desire. Okay, So again, the new feature for the version 30 is being able to check in process stock. So if I come back to this one and I edit it, and it's still under gouge check, but you'll see this option over here where it says check holder with in process stock, or you could also check on machining surfaces as well. Okay, so with in process stock, really what's happening is the the software's algorithm is checking the holder against the stock as it's calculating the toolpath. Okay, so it's a, a really uh, useful feature to trim away unwanted motion and you know it actually does a better job than what the checking with the check surfaces here you can see we're getting these direct links and if you're running a ball mill or something like that that may uh, be doable uh, if you're dealing with a non center cutting tool or you know a tool that you don't want to plunge plunge even though I'm showing it plunging here uh, that may not be the best result so uh, using the in-process stock, you can see how it backs the toolpath away from the edge and makes sure that the holder does not collide um, with the model. Okay, so again, that's the new feature here. Uh, some of you may be wondering, well, what is the difference between um, in-process stock and machining surface? And, and these are basically a couple of options. Uh, you got to turn in process stock on in order for it to check the in process stock. You can add machining surfaces when you have surfaces that are not fully contained within the stock um, geometry. So I'll make sure, basically it's just another cleanup. Okay. All right. Very good. Now, are there any questions about that? Okay, one of the things that I do want to throw out here, um, when we look at the calculation times for uh, holder checking, uh, it can get a little bit longer because there is more math that's going on, all right? So one of the tips that I have is on simpler geometry, uh, instead of using uh, check against the holder, I, I do recommend you consider using top and bottom of job. You can go into parameters here, and then you can say user defined. 
uh, top uh, top of job, not necessarily, but bottom of job, you know, don't go any deeper than this value. Uh, that's an easy way in order to make sure the holder wouldn't collide with the surfaces. If you're not sure what this value should be, you can always go to your tool and you can look at your protrusion length, which would be how far your tool is hanging out from your arbor or tool holder. So that's a, a quick little tip uh, for faster calculation times. Now, if you're dealing with more complex geometry uh, where it may uh, you may have part geometry in different places. Obviously, that wouldn't necessarily work. Uh, just giving it a static Z level to not go any deeper than. Uh, so that is where you know the in-process stock is a, a great new feature. So if there's any questions about that, um, go ahead and throw it out. I do have another uh, model that I'm working on here. So let me close this one out for just a second, and uh, we'll open up the next model here. Okay, so this is um, another example of where you're dealing with some part geometry and you may have a, a deeper level over here. So again, you don't want the tool holder to run into that part geometry. If we look at a no check routine here and we back plot this, uh, let me uh, kind of get to a solid view here and we'll run this down the line. You can see as we go deeper and deeper into the part, because we're using a short stub tool, uh, we're basically going to run into this part of the geometry here. So let's go ahead and um, let me turn this one on. So we'll do post yes, no. And then uh, we're going to go ahead and launch simulation. Larry had a question. Go back to the original tool path to finish the job. You know, um, that's a really good question. There's a couple of ways that you can attack once you've removed the material uh, with the shorter tool, you know that you have leftover material that's on the part, whether you're roughing or, um, or semi-finishing. So what I would recommend, I mean, there's a couple of ways to do it. You could do it with a boundary. You could do it with an angle range. You could do it with a top and bottom of job. Um, but you could also do it with operation stock, where you could save out the stock model and then use that as your boundary for your next roughing routine. So uh, hopefully that makes sense, Larry. Uh, if you're not familiar with operation stock um, or saving out your stock models, then that would be something you'd want to look at. Will you be doing any 2D milling from part prints and not models? Sure, Larry. Um, right now I'm just going through the new features in the version 30 um, in this series, and then we'll get into some project work um, over the next couple of months. So hang in there. Uh, if you have a part print that you'd like to submit, you can email it to al, al at bobcad.com, and I'll definitely review it to be used in a webinar for 2D, uh, 2D milling from print. All right, very good. So I got my model up here. Let me, um, a couple of things that I want to do, uh, you know, as you guys may or may not know, you can go to the view um, tab here and you can turn on the different options in the simulation as needed. Um, in this case, I want to, uh, we'll just make this the tool number. We'll make this orange, which seems to be my new favorite color. And then um, uh, what do I want to do here? I want to go to simulation. I want to show my stock. Okay, I'm actually going to hide the tool path here and we'll just run this down for a second and let it uh, calculate here. So as the tool goes down, basically what's going to happen is we're going to run out of uh, clearance and that holder is going to run into this part. Okay, so if we scroll it along, you can see once we make contact with the part, we're going to start getting flags. Um, if we go to, let's see here, and we go to view and we're on our move list. You can see if we start hitting the part, we'll get some X's that comes up. Um, the other thing that you have is your reports. Your reports will come in here and they'll start showing where these collisions are to tell you what's going on. Um, so th these are things to, to consider. You can also just see that uh, the part model is not, um, you know, the stock model doesn't represent uh, the part model. Uh, let's see, the question, how you turn on the runtime clock in the simulation? Um, the runtime clock, Tim, just is turned on automatically. If you want to view um, the cycle time, you can go to statistics, and this will have all the different statistics of the job 
um, or the operation, okay? There's a couple of places that you can go to get this information, uh, but you can find it in uh, simulation as well. All right, so as we, we scroll through here, you can see we're definitely uh, beating up our part model here a little bit, and this is exactly what we're trying to avoid. Um, you know, it's not always as apparent as we see here. There are a couple of things that I'll generally do. I may take my stock and make it transparent. Um, this is uh, an easy way to kind of see what's going on. The other thing you can do is if you just turn off your um, your uh, your workpiece, you'll also be able to see, you know, hey, this is definitely cutting into our part model. It will show up in red if the holder is hitting. So that's going to show up as well. And all of these things are things we're trying to avoid. Okay. So, all right. So let's close out simulation here. Now, if we look at the next routine here, this routine is really the same tool path. There's nothing, um, there's nothing different about it. Uh, let me see here. Blank. As far as the settings, other than using the holder, um, the holder checking. Okay, so we go to gouge check, check holder with in process stock. You know, we calculate that tool path, and then you're going to see how the tool path is going to be moving off of that part model. So as it's uh, going down the routine here, let me turn this one off. Let's turn this one on. We'll launch simulation, and we'll take a look. Uh, hey, Larry, no problem. Uh, there will be a recording sent to you, so hopefully we see you in the next one. Thank you so much for uh, spending some time with me here today. All right, so again, uh, I'm just going to run through the, the simulation here. I'll pull the progress bar up, and then you'll see that it will uh, calculate. And then, uh, you know, we can turn our visibility of our tool path. You know, so this is one of the ways that you can advance through. Uh, through the routine to see what's going on. But again, what's happening here is we are uh, roughing out this routine, but because we cho chose the uh, holder collision avoidance with the in-process stock, uh, you'll see that the tool toolpath and the holder will, the toolpath will be bumped out in order to accommodate for that holder so we can use uh, shorter, uh, stubbier tools. We'll go all the way through. And then that's what we're looking at there. Uh, can the advanced rough come in this in the west off time, but use proper length save time? I'm not sure what you're asking there. Could you try um, this is west off time, but use proper length? I'm, I, I'm sorry. I'm not sure exactly what that is. Can the advanced rough come in from the outside of the stock rather than plunging? Yes, Russ, uh, the advanced uh, roughing can come in from the outside of the stock. It is a stock aware toolpath and will start off the part automatically. In this case, I use the boundary to force it to stay uh, within that area, which forced it to plunge. And there's some reasons why I did that, which uh, maybe we'll get into. All right. So, so we have this again, this is the same part model. Nothing else is different. The only thing was different was the holder checking and you can see how the, the toolpath did not run into the part. All right, so one of the other questions we talked about, how do we target this material with a, uh, a, a, a rest roughing routine, or how do we come back and target that material? Um, one of the options that we have in here under view is cut sim. When we're in cut sim, you can go to your uh, you know, floppy folder here, you can do save, and you can set, I'm gonna set a resolution, here, so I'm going to save my stock out as an STL file, and uh, now I have the in-process stock itself, which then I can use as my operation stock for my rest roughing routine, okay? So that's how you can combine multiple routines like this and uh, be able to target that material. So we'll save that out. Um, we'll close that out here. Now, again, you may be wondering, well, how do I... Um, how do I use the, the operation stock? Well, you can see here, you can select operation stock um, from within the, the tree, and then you can use the trim to stock option. You may have a question, uh, how do I get my stock within the file? You can do a merge, and then just choose that STL file, and uh, bring it in that way. So that way we have, let's see here, that way we have our stock that we can address now, all right? And actually, um, 
in general, it's not the worst practice in more complex geometry in order to um, uh, save out your stock and then bring it in to compare, you get a visual compare to see where things are at. Now in this routine here, I'm going to select this as my, um, uh, of course it's a browse. I guess you, you, you don't actually have to drop it within uh, the system. You can browse the directory and um, uh, give me a second here. And I'll open that up. This wasn't originally part of what I wanted to show, but I think it's a good thing to pick up here. All right. Uh, Gene asks, what kind of computer do I run? Um, I can send the specs out to you. Nothing crazy. I think it's an i5. Um, I, i5, Windows 7, some RAM, and I do have an NVIDIA video card. I do recommend um, NVIDIA as your video card. Uh, they seem I, I seem to have the best results in that. Uh, yes, Reginald, uh, you can save your stock in V5, uh, Bobcam V5. It's the, the same process there. Okay, so we got our stock set up now. Uh, let me blank that out. You can see that that stock is there. Again, if we're doing um, in our no check routine here, what I'm going to do is just... Uh, change my protrusion length, you know, maybe it's two inches out, I could um, remove my holder, I could change my holder, but what I want to do is, uh, let's see if I have to check trim to stock, doesn't look like I do, no, and then by adding this stock here, uh, this tool path will then be trimmed to that stock geometry and that's how you can use a longer tool to go in and to target where that other material was that was left from the shorter stubbier tool okay all right very good now let's see what else I got to cover here so that was the advanced rough again uh, using this process here we could check against in process stock we could save out our stock and then we could use our operation stock to target that material so this one did the main roughing with the shorter tool this one came back and did the um, did the uh, rest roughing with either a longer tool hangout or um, or a different tool holder. I'm not sure if it's making contact here. It doesn't look like it is. But again, we could use our in process stock again in order to check uh, check against it and continue to move down the line. All right. Okay. Very good. Now I did want to just show. I have a, a couple of other examples here. This is the Z-level finish. Again, this is without checking. What ends up happening here is the tool holder uh, ends up running into this part model here. You can see it pretty clearly. Using the same workflow I showed in the first file, um, this same routine here, uh, just using the check surfaces against the holder, will push this tool out so that holder doesn't run up against that model. Okay. All right, very good. And then uh, on this one here, when we get into the advanced planer, um, again, just showing a, a planer routine, so we're going back and forth. Um, this tool obviously is going to end up running up into that part model. So what we can do is use our check surfaces here, and then this way we can get that tool to stay away from that wall and not run into that part model. Okay, so just... Uh, just some review and also the workflow there. Uh, David, thank you so much. I uh, look forward to seeing you in the, in the next one. All right. Now, the next routine that I – if there's any questions about that, go ahead and fire away. Um, otherwise, we're going to move on to the next topic. So let me uh, close this file out here, and we'll get into the next one. So <clears throat> what we're talking about is the adaptive roughing vertical arc lead-in and lead-out. Uh, what this does is it attempts to enter and exit the material tangent to the surfaces being machined with a vertical arc move, okay? So when we get in here, this is our advanced rough routine. So you can see how, you know, we're just coming in here. We're doing uh, like twice diameter cutting and we're roughing this out. Now, if we go to a front view here, you can see how as the tool approaches, it approaches vertically. Um, we do see our micro lifts here as well, but as the tool comes down, uh, the tool is approaching vertically. So if we edit our feature and we go to leads, you'll see our leads is set to vertical. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch 
uh, simulation here. So we're going to do module simulation. And then in simulation, I'm going to talk about some of the toolpath uh, display options, which I think are uh, maybe unseen. Maybe you guys aren't aware of them. So what we're going to do is turn our stock to hide. Okay, we have the display of our toolpath right now. Um, I'm going to turn the visibility of my workpiece on. It just helps uh, show the toolpath a little bit better. Now, you know, we want to figure out where the tool is plunging into the material um, or where it's entering the material. So we're going to go to views. We're going to go to analysis for toolpath. And you have a bunch of different options that you can use here. If you haven't explored these, I highly recommend that you do so. Um, if we go down to where it says height change, you're going to see a, a couple of things here. Plunge is in red, down is in orange, uh, horizontal is in this blue, green up, and retract green. Okay. So what's nice about this is you can really look at what's going on with your toolpath and be able to tell where everything is. Like when we look at our micro moves, we can see which one's going down. We can also see which one's going up. Uh, it just makes it really easy to see what's going on with your toolpath. So I definitely recommend you explore that. Um, in this particular case, we're looking at all these red lines because these are your plunge moves and the vertical arc lead-in for the adaptive roughing um, is going to change these moves. That's where you're going to see it. Not, not necessarily all of them. It will change them where it can, um, but those are the ones that are going to turn into uh, what you're going to see as vertical uh, arcs. Okay, so let's go back and turn the option on. Let me close this out. We're going to go back to the advanced rough here. We're going to go to uh, leads, we'll check on our vertical arc lead, and then we'll recompute the toolpath. That's really all you have to do for that, um, is recompute the toolpath. Now, while that's computing, um, you know, guys, if, if you do run into system issues, because I know some people are like, you know, I've had problems with 26, and you know, or I've had problems with, um, you know, updates and things like that, it is really important that you do run the most current build of the software. Uh, that's what we uh, we do. We do update the software. So you want to make sure you're on the current build. You want to make sure your graphics drivers are up to date. But more importantly, if you're having problems with the software running properly on your system, you definitely want to call support. Uh, they have really good technicians that are down there that can help you, that specialize in this. Something like you know, telling your graphics card to give memory to Bobcad. You know, there, there are little things. It could be Windows 7, Windows 10. It could be RAM. A lot of different things. It's computers. It happens across the board. It's not just uh, a Bobcad thing. It's a CAD CAM software thing. So uh, the more feedback and information you give us, uh, specifically to the support department, the better it is. Okay. So that was my little... Uh, little dialogue there for you. Uh, but I'm a user too and I experience it myself. So I do understand uh, just like what we're seeing here today. Okay, so these are the new vertical lead-ins. You can see how they come in as a vertical arc. Um, it doesn't do them everywhere, but it does do it in a lot of places. There are some places where it still plunges, where it doesn't have room. Uh, this will give you a smooth transition in and it will also give you a smooth transition out. It is a lead in and lead out option. I will go into uh, simulation here. So we're going to go to simulation. And again, within simulation, where's uh, Larry had a question. Where's the current build listed? Um, it's, it's on the support page. If you log into the support portal, it'll give you information about um, what's current um, and where to download it and all that kind of stuff. All right, so we're going to track our red lines here. We can zoom in, and here in orange, we can see we have these vertical uh, radius lead-ins, um, you know, and lead-outs. Let me see here. So we can see how it comes in and then works its way around, or you can see how it comes in um, and works its way around, and then you can also see how it leads out with these radiuses. So, again, this is new for adaptive roughing for mill uh, Mill Pro is what you're going to have this in. Uh, you don't have this in uh, 2D pocketing at this time. This is just in the Mill uh, Pro adaptive roughing. All right. So the last thing I'm going to do on this file here is, again, I just want to talk about uh, 
And, uh, Andrea, thank you so much. Look forward to uh, seeing you in the next one. Um, okay, so I just want to uh, talk about, again, some of the different tools that we have here for the toolpath display. Again, you can show the tool number. If you want to change the color, you can click on it, and you can change the color. I know I generally like to have green as my uh, toolpath. Um, you can come in here. You can look at the operation number if you have multiple operations. Um, the sequence one is the one that I've been using a lot lately. Um, you know, it just shows where it's at at the start of the cut and where it's at at the end of the cut. With this color mapping, I do find that very useful so I can see what's going on. So uh, sequence is what we're looking at there. And then um, you get into axis reversal, orientation change. Some of this stuff you're going to find more useful when you start getting into four axis and, and five axis machining. You know, you got your feed rate. Again, the height change was the one that I was using here today. So if you haven't explored these tools for your toolpath, I definitely um, recommend you take a look and you go through some of those. There's a lot of really good features there. Okay, so now let's move on to the next one. Um, this one, unless there's any additional questions about that, go ahead and throw them out. Uh, this one here, where are we on? We're on four. This is going to be undercutting with the mill professional okay so with mill professional when you're doing a z level finish okay as an advanced z level finish you do have the ability to do an undercut okay so if i back plot this this tool here i have set up as a t cutter so you can do this with uh, your t cutters all right this one here i have set up with a uh, lollipop so you can do this with lollipops as well okay so you got t cutters and you have lollipops now um, in this this first part example this is just a straight taper i mean you know if we come into the feature itself and we go under our parameters or let's see options when we go under options um, this is where you're going to see the undercut option that you can turn on or turn off um, you, when you turn it on, it will machine both the vertical and the undercuts. If you check machine only the undercuts, then it will target only the undercuts, okay? In this example here, I just have a straight wall, and you can see uh, we have our, our T cutter, and then we also have our lollipop cutter uh, going around this profile. So those are the two routines there. Now, if I switch up the geometry, and let's say we go to... Uh, something that has a draft, I'm going to remove and reselect. We'll select this and we can compute this. So, T cutter, lollipop, you got a positive draft, you got a straight wall, you got a positive draft, no problem. You can calculate this, it's going to work for your T cutter, it's also going to work for your lollipop cutter. Okay, now if you have an outside negative draft, that is going to be supported as well. So if we switch over to the next uh, uh, model here, let me remove, reselect, select all. I'm going to go ahead and compute this. You'll see that we can attack this with our T cutter for our negative draft on the outside, and then we can also attack this with our lollipop cutter. Okay, so here we can see the T cutter. This one I'll compute for the lollipop cutter. All right, so what I'm showing you here is straight walls. I'm showing you positive, uh, and then I'm also showing you a negative draft, okay? So now what about if you have an inside shape or something like this, all right? You can work with a straight wall. Of course, you can work with a positive draft, but you're also going to be able to work with a negative draft, and that's what we're, that's what we're seeing here is this is a negative draft, so we'll go ahead and remove and reselect our geometry, and then we'll recompute this one, and then we'll recompute the next one, and we'll see how that toolpath will update to machine the negative draft. So again, this is a new feature uh, that we have in the Mill Professional with the advanced Z level finish, uh, supporting uh, lollipop T cutters. You can do straight walls, tapered walls, uh, negative tapered walls. Okay, when we come in here, in order to turn the option on, it's under options, 
and undercut, that's where you turn it on. If we do say machine undercut only, it will ignore the vertical walls and it will just attack the tapered walls, okay? If there's any questions about that, um, go ahead and let me know. And also, you know, it's, as far as the cut patterns, you can start at the top and work its way down, or you can also start at the bottom and work its way up. So both um, cutting patterns, top down or bottom up is supported with this routine. All right, so that's all I have on that particular one. If there's any questions, go ahead and fire away. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to the next file. So I got about uh, just under 10 minutes left, and the next topic for us here is the mill uh, premium toolpaths, okay? So the mill premium toolpaths uh, really offer a lot of flexibility. This is a new uh, option for the version 30 software is the mill premium toolpaths, okay? So where in the cam tree are you gonna find the mill premium toolpaths? Well, if you go to the cam tree and you go to mill multi-axis, this is where you're gonna find the mill premium toolpaths, okay? Within mill premium, you have your surface-based toolpaths, and all of these toolpaths are now available for our three axis customers. As a mill premium customer, you have eight additional surface-based toolpaths that you can use in three axis. Okay, so it really expands upon you know, the type of things that you can do with the software, and I'm, I'm gonna get into a couple examples here. Okay, so, the first thing that I'm looking at here, this is uh, an advanced rough routine that I'm using. I have um, this model. I got, I got the model from uh, GrabCAD. It was a steering wheel. Let me see here. There was like a goat cart that had this steering wheel, and it had some blended surfaces. I, th I thought it would make a, a decent little part. So, you know, what I did is I used the, um, I rotated it, and I used the solid imprint feature in order to create the cavity. And then, you know, you can see that there's these little holes that are in it as well. So then what I did is I used an, ex an extrude cut, and what that did was cut those holes out of the, the model, okay? So that's, uh, that's how I prep my design. Now, from here, there's a bunch of, you know, different things that you look at, like these blended surfaces here, you know, um, trying to clean up or machine these surfaces. There's lots of different ways to go at them. And when we look at our surface base tool pass, we get just a couple of more options than you may have had before. So, you know, let's, let's set up with a, a ball mill here. Okay, let me go to the type of tool path. So the real popular ones are flow line is very popular, um, parallel to multiple curves is very popular as well, and then you have your morphing strategies. These, these three are very popular, but really all of them have their place, okay? So in this example, I'm gonna look at flow line. Um, I'm gonna select my drive surface. My drive surface is gonna be this surface here, uh, you know, the steering wheel shape, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and select that surface. Now for me, I have a multi-axis license for four and five axis, so I have to go and pick limit to three axis. If you're a mill premium user, it will be defaulted to three axis, because that's all you have access to, all right? Now from here, you know, when we're in our surface path, we have a bunch of different options. I'm just gonna change this to zigzag. I'm gonna go to my uh, link option, and I'll go to my retracts and set this to automatic and then I'm just gonna compute the toolpath. And what we're gonna see is some toolpath created on the screen. Uh, let me come in here and change the color of it. So we'll make this green. And here you can see our toolpath. This is gonna be a flow line style toolpath. And uh, this would be used to finish uh, finish this, uh, this shape here, this, uh, the, the steering wheel handle. Now, the thing is, is what you're finding is there's some gaps along this cut here where you can see the tool is going to clearance, all right? Now, um, one of the really awesome things that you can do with these surface-based tool paths is you can control what happens in those sections. So if I go to parameters and I go to links, I have gaps along the cut, and then I also have links between slices, okay? So in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my large gap size, 
and I have a bunch of options that I can use. In this case, I'm going to use blended spline, and then I'm going to recompute the toolpath. And then what that does is, because there was a gap here, it just um, blends it over with a, a spline to connect that area to give us a nice, consistent toolpath that goes all the way around. So again, that's a... Um, a flow line strategy there and one of the new uh, toolpaths that you'll have as a mill premium user. Now another thing that we can do here is we could do like um, like one of these uh, uh, the morph routine. So let me blank this out. We'll load in another cutting strategy. Actually let me just take this one, copy and paste. Okay. So from here I can edit this Instead of flow line, I'm going to do uh, morph between two surfaces, and next, we'll use the same size cutter. I'm going to go to my parameters. I'll pick my first surface, which will be this top surface here. I'm going to pick my second surface, which is going to be this bottom surface here, and then I'm going to pick my drive surfaces, which will be all of these surfaces in here in this section. Okay, so that's what I want to uh, make sure that I get. So I have those surfaces there. Um, there's a little, uh, some little stuff up here. So let's go ahead and grab that too. Uh, that one. And that one there. Okay. So all of this looks good. Let's just, I'm going to loosen this up a little bit and then recompute. And again, this is going to be a morphing strategy. I would use this in this particular example. I'm probably going to use this more as um, as like a, like a semi-finish or something to come in and rough here because for this particular part, a Z-level finish does a, does a really good job. But again, this is a morphing routine. Uh, there's some different options that you have here. Let me bump this uh, step over up a little bit and then we'll recompute. You can see you can adjust the step over, but this is going to morph from one curve to the other, and really just using the input as I did there uh, made that pretty, uh, pretty easy to do. Now another one, like I talked about, is parallel to multiple curves, so let's take a look at that one. So we'll do mill three x or um, multi-axis surface, but actually let me, uh, let me just copy this down again. So we'll paste it, okay. We're going to uh, edit. This is going to be parallel to multiple curves. I'm going to use and just drop down the tool size a little bit. Go to our parameters. We have our edge curve. Our edge curve we could say is this curve here. Our drive surface we could say is this surface here. Um, determine number of cuts. I could say, you know, just make three cuts. I could set what that amount is. Uh, let's go ahead and compute. And there you can see I get some tool path that runs along that edge. And of course you can make adjustments to the step over and everything else. But I did want to give you a, a quick run through with that. Those are three of the most popular tool paths in the mill premium surface based strategies. Obviously a, a lot more options. Uh, to show, but I did want to do a quick introduction. Um, you know, as we continue to move forward with what's new in V30, uh, we do have the four axis um, routines, four and five axis routines we need to get into. There's a bunch of options in simulation, so um, I'm going to do my best to wrap, wrap that up over the next um, probably two webinars or so. I, I really appreciate everybody spending some time with me here today uh, to go over um, some of the new features in the in the V30 and in the in the talk with you and, and answer your questions. So I appreciate you showing up here today. Um, that's what I have for today's uh, webinar. There's a few minutes left, so I can open it up to any Q and A uh, that you guys may have. Um, is that a rapid move on the blend? No, there are no rapid moves on the blend um, here. These are all feed moves. The dotted lines would be rapid moves. Uh, no problem, James. We'll see you next time. You know, and uh, in case, you know, this is uh, manufacturing week as well. Uh, so if you guys uh, have been on our website, I know they have a big promotion that's going on right now for the multi-axis packages. If it's something you guys have been considering, um, you know, call, call them up. You know, give them a call. Tell them that Al said the call. And, uh, you know, 
let them know that uh, I said take care of them. You know, just say that. Al said take care of take care of me. So I'm sure they'll be there to to take care of you guys and your needs. If there's any other questions, um, you know, go ahead and fire away. Otherwise, we're going to get wrapped up here in just a moment. Uh, yep. Uh, again, thank you so much for spending some time with me here today. Uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you so much. Um, Dustin, you may be running a four axis standard license. Uh, I would definitely talk with your account manager. I'm sure they'll take care of you. Uh, yep, Michael, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much, Tony, for showing up. Tom, good to see you in there. Uh, George, I appreciate your time here today. What's the limit? What's limited from the standard mill package to the pro mill package to the premium? Um, so what's going on there, Tim? Is mill standard has six three-axis cutting strategies. Mill pro has seven three-axis cutting strategies, and mill premium has eight three-axis cutting strategies. If you do primarily 2D machining and you just occasionally run 3D. Uh, mill standard is the way to go. If you do more 3D tool die mold, um, it could be parts themselves, but a lot of curvature and 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 things like that. Then yeah, you would you definitely would want to be either a mill pro or mill premium user. So hopefully that answers your question there. Got about a minute left, guys. So hurry up and get them in before it's too late. Hey Dirk, great to see you again. Hopefully everything's going well over there. Uh, yes, Dustin, I will definitely enjoy the rest of my day. Thank you so much. Yes, Michael, I uh, definitely, um, yeah, and if you guys, um, we do have a uh, new group, uh, or I have a new group on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, uh, Bobcat After Dark uh, group, you can search on Facebook, and um, it is a private meeting. It's a small, or I'm sorry, it's a private group. It is a small group at this time. But if you uh, would like to join, just uh, go ahead and request, and it'd be great to see you in there. No problem, Roger. Yeah, I know it's it's it always seems like it's a little to cover, but then once I get into it, it, it just seems like so much. So uh, hopefully the recording does you good. Um, Dean had a question. I'm new. Can you explain drive surface? Um, drive surface would really be the 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 surface that you want that tool path to be driven along. Okay, so. Let me, uh, let me get out of this. So if we look at, um, you know, in this case here, you can see this tool path, you know, this is parallel to multiple curves. So this is the the curves that I'm selected. And actually, it's not this surface here, but it's the, the curves that are along this fillet that's there. That's what I've selected that the tool path will be parallel tool. But what it's parallel tool to would be, um, driven along the drive surface. So the, the drive surface is really like the surface you want the toolpath created on. So hopefully that makes sense. Is it X-rated cam surface, drive surface? Um, no, it's not X-rated. Some of the early Bobcat After Dark videos are, though. <laughs> but, all right, guys, I want to thank each and every one of you for showing up here today. I uh, look forward to seeing you in the next one. We will have a webinar next week as well, so hope to see you in there. If there's any topics you guys would like to see coming uh, covered in up-and-coming webinars, like uh, 2.5D from uh, a Blueprint, uh, go ahead and request that. You can always email me, uh, al at bobcad.com, or reply to the invitations that we send out. Other than that, I really appreciate everybody's time here today and look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you so much.